Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. And it's the English faculty lecture room, and it's about this size, and it's packed with people on the floor exactly like this. And I'm sitting over there in the front row, and the door bursts open, and in walks C.S. Lewis. <laughs> and he's dressed, a big man like me, he's dressed in a winter overcoat, and a hat, and a scarf, and he starts lecturing the moment he comes through the door. And he picks his way among the students, and he comes up to the podium, and by the time he's got to the podium, he's got his hat off and his scarf off, but his coat not quite off, and he's lecturing at full blast. And that goes on for 50 minutes, word perfect, no notes. And then he reverses the process. So still lecturing, he puts on his hat, and he winds <laughs> up his scarf, and he picks his way through the students, and these last words are delivered as he goes through the double doors. <laughs> no time for questions. <laughs> so it's really lovely to see so many of you here at this famous university. It's my first time in this part of the United States, and you've asked me to talk to you about the question, is God relevant? That brings back another very vivid memory of Siberia, where a number of years ago I gave the very first lecture in 75 years on the topic, A Mathematician Discusses Belief in a Creator. And I remember in the Mathematics Institute in Akadim Gorodok in Novosibirsk, I started to talk to some of my academic colleagues, and I said, do you ever talk about God here? And they grinned at me, and they said, do you talk about green cows in your department? And I said, no, I don't talk about green cows. And they said, why don't you talk about green cows? I said, because they don't exist. He said, that's why we don't talk about God. And it is extremely interesting, isn't it, to see that today particularly, because of the dominance of naturalism in the academy, God is deemed to be irrelevant. Now, of course, the word relevant raises questions. Relevant for what and to whom? And I want to explore this a little bit with you. I wish I had time to ask you what you thought was relevant. How many of you are doing science? Put your hands up. Okay. How many of you are doing the humanities? And how many of you are doing something else? Okay. <laughs> Well, we're roughly equally divided. That means that there are certain things you've decided are relevant to you now. But one of the very interesting things in life is this, that many of the things that you learn now, they're relevant for a very short space of time. Some of you might be honest enough to say, well, I want to get my class grades, and then I forget all about this stuff. I'll never use it again. Isn't that true? And then there are hidden things that you don't know are relevant. For example, I wonder if I were to ask you, how relevant to you is the square root of minus one? How many of you have a smartphone? Put your hands up. <laughs> Come on, be honest. How many of you have a smartphone? Most of you. Well, of course, the electronics in any smartphone depend critically on complex analysis, which involves the square root of minus one. And yet, to many of you, if I asked you, is it relevant? No, it's not relevant. But it is relevant. And so, the moment we begin to probe into this notion of relevance, it raises all kinds of questions. Now, let's start at the lowest level, really. Those of you who recognize my accent will know that I come from Ireland. And 
immediately people say, well, of course God's relevant to you Irish, and you fight about God all the time. <laughs> and really, what it boils down to is you need some sort of little crutch to support your lives on. You know, Freud explained you Irish a long time ago. And he communicated the idea that your God is relevant to you because he's a kind of wish fulfillment, but he doesn't actually exist. That's worth exploring because there's been a recent book by one of Germany's most distinguished psychiatrists, Manfred Lutz. The book is called Eine kleine Geschichte des Größten. And you can work out what that means. Uh, it means a brief history of the Great One. And what he says is this, if there is no God, if there is no God, then Freud gives you a brilliant argument to tell you that God has been created as a wish fulfillment for people who want a crutch in their lives. But then he gives the twist, and he said, of course, if there is a God, Freud's argument will give you an equally good reason for atheism being a crutch. But on the crucial question as to whether there is a God or not, Freud can't help you, Jung can't help you, Frankel can't help you. You'll have to look somewhere else. Now, we're going to be, in a very short lecture like this, discussing things at various levels simultaneously. But coming from Ireland with Christian parents and Christian grandparents, the relevance of God to me was first demonstrated in the reality of God in my parents' lives. I've got to be open with you about that, because each of us have a biography. We have a story where we come from. And of course, the moment I mention that, you'll say, well, of course God's relevant to you, but that's just the problem. I debated Peter Singer not long ago in Australia, and I started very much like this. And he said, of course, there goes my biggest objection to religion people usually stay in the religion in which they've been brought up, like you. So when I got a chance to speak, I said, Peter, we'd better uh, clear the air a bit here and see exactly where we're at. Tell me about your parents. Were they atheists? And he said, yes, they were. <laughs> oh, I said, so you stayed with the faith in which you grew up. Oh, but he said, it isn't a faith. Oh, I said, sorry, Peter, I thought you believed it. Now, that little interchange with one of the world's leading philosophers, ladies and gentlemen, points up a whole lot of things that we need to explore tonight. Because he thought that what I believe is a faith system, but not what he believes. It's not a faith system. And yet it is, as many philosophers who listened to him were utterly amazed that one of the world's leading philosophers from Princeton didn't recognize that his naturalism is a faith system. He believes it. And so we could look at it this way. Here we are tonight, and we come from different backgrounds, and we have different worldviews, but really, in the room, what's at stake is the question of which worldview not is simply relevant, but is true. And there really are only two major ones, or maybe three. And that can help us focus the discussion a little bit. The ancient Greeks, you know, were very clever people, and some of them had the idea of the atom, something that cannot be cut. And they came to the conclusion that the universe is made of atoms and the void. And that's all there is, mass energy, as we would say today. They were the atomists. They were the materialists. They were the forerunners of the Richard Dawkins and the Peter Atkins of this world. And that's the dominant philosophy in the academy. That this universe is all that exists, there is no God, there's no transcendence, and therefore, the nature of explanation is such that you've got to explain everything bottom-up or reduce it to physics and chemistry. There is an alternative. And in the ancient world, there were people like my intellectual hero Socrates, who went around asking questions until they forced him to commit suicide, <laughs> Plato and Aristotle, who believed with the majority of great thinkers throughout the ages that there is transcendence, that there is a God who created the universe and who upholds it. 
Now, so we have coming up through into our academy today, through history, those two dominant worldviews. Now, there are others, but we haven't time to look at them tonight. And the question is, yes, which one is relevant, but as you get older and get more involved in things intellectual in your university, I hope you are asking the truth question. Which one is true? And I happen to believe that the Christian worldview is true. And by saying that, I know I'm I'm in a minority, certainly in the academy where I work in the University of Oxford. So what I want to do is to discuss with you some of the ways into this very question. The relevance of God. Well, people say to me, look, you're a scientist. Do you talk about God when you're teaching algebra? No, you don't, do you? No, I don't. Well, you don't need God there, do you? And they often remind me of the famous encounter between Napoleon and Laplace, the mathematician. And Napoleon was reading Laplace's book on ballistics and mechanics, and he said to Laplace, Monsieur Laplace, where is God in your equations? And Laplace famously answered, je n'ai pas besoin de cette hypothèse. I don't need that hypothesis. And if you consult many scientists today, they'll say exactly the same. We agree with Laplace. We don't need the hypothesis of God. He's totally irrelevant to anything that we do. Now, I want to challenge that, and I want to challenge it in... uh, several uh, various ways. But first of all, let's get another little background picture from history. One of the very odd things is that university students and the rest of us indeed are being forced by people like Stephen Hawking, Lawrence Krauss at ASU, Richard Dawkins, to choose between God and science as if there was some hostility between belief in God and the scientific endeavor. And yet, when you trace back the origins of science, modern science, it's utterly fascinating. Because modern science exploded in the 16th and 17th centuries in Western Europe. And philosophers and historians of science have asked the question, why did it happen then, and why did it happen there? And although there, this has to be nuanced, a lot has been written about it, by and large the consensus of opinion is this. C.S. Lewis put it very well when he was summarizing the work of Alfred North Whitehead, the famous philosopher, and he said this, men became scientific because they expected law in nature. And they expected law and nature because they believed in a lawgiver. In other words, far from the notion of God being irrelevant to science, it was the motor that drove science in the first place. Now, that is simply a fact of history, but it's a fact of history that a lot of people don't realize. Going back to my lecture in Academ Gorodok in Siberia all those years ago, I remember I came to a point in the lecture where I was talking about the rise of science and the remarkable fact that Galileo and Kepler and Newton and Clark Maxwell and so on all believed in God. And I noticed the professors in the front row getting very angry, and I don't like people getting very angry. So I stopped. And I said to this professor in the front row, I said, sir, excuse me, I can't help noticing you're angry. And he stood up and he said, I am angry, but not with you. I said, why are you angry? He said, why have we never been told that these men believed in God? He said, I think I speak for everybody here that this is the first time in our lives we've ever heard that Kepler, Galileo, Newton, and Clark Maxwell believed in God. And I'm afraid I couldn't resist saying to them, can't you guess why you were never told? 
You see, historically, this is a legacy. And the irony of the contemporary situation is that science gives the impression to the public that it has turned its back on God. Now, of course, people will say, yes, but you see, in the 16th and 17th century, everybody believed in God. And now, those were the infantile stages. Now, we've outgrown that chrysalis and the butterfly can fly, and we don't need concepts of God at all. And so, it was simply an infancy stage, and in fact, we've discovered that God is not relevant. And so, you have to choose between, uh, you'll have to choose now between God and science. Now, there is such pressure, I discover, in this choice, and Stephen Hawking has really ratcheted it up uh, in uh, the last uh, couple of years, that I began to think, why is it that they are so convinced that it's God or science. And I've come to the conclusion that it's actually very easy to understand. And the reason is this. It's not so much, although we'll see it does depend on some false ideas about science, but it starts with a false idea of God. You see, ladies and gentlemen, if you're going to say God is not relevant, you better start by asking what you mean by God. And what do we mean by God? Now, what I discover from many of my scientific colleagues is they think, I believe in a God who is a God of the gaps. That is, I can't explain it, therefore God did it. Now, if you believe in a God of the gaps like that, it's clear you have to choose between science and God, because God, by definition, is the explanation for the things that science hasn't yet explained. So, in the ancient world, when they didn't understand atmospheric physics, they thought that thunder was a roaring of the gods. And then you do a little bit of atmospheric physics, and you discover it's got nothing to do with the God, so God exit from that space. Do you get the idea? If you believe that God is simply, I can't explain it, God did it, then you must choose between God and science, because the more God, the less science, the more science, the less God. But you see, I've never met an intelligent Christian, Jew or Muslim, who believed in a God of the gaps. God is the God of the whole show, the bits we understand and the bits we don't understand. And of course, that kind of argument does not apply to the God who's revealed to us in the Bible. But we need to think a bit harder about this, because there is such a pressure to say, well, it's either God or science. So, I want to give you a second reason why this uh, has come to be. And now it's a confusion on the scientific side as to the nature of explanation. Explanation is something that I hope you study in all of your disciplines. Because very frequently, we have the impression, science explains. Putting God up just says, well, God did it, and there's no explanatory value there. Now, let's explore that a little bit. Explanation has different levels. When Isaac Newton discovered his law of gravitation, he didn't say, I've got a law that explains it, therefore I don't need God. What did he do? He wrote the most brilliant book in the history of science, Principia Mathematica, expressing in it the hope that it would persuade the thinking person to believe in a creator. Now, it's worth following his logic. Because this is not God of the gaps thinking, this is the exact opposite. What Newton is saying is, look, I've discovered 
something of the way in which the Creator works. Isn't it brilliant? And his additional scientific knowledge increased his faith in God. Now, you think for a moment, that's the way it works at all levels. The more you understand of mechanical engineering, the more you can admire the genius of a Rolls or a Royce. The more you understand of how difficult it is to paint, the more you can admire the genius of a Rubens or a Picasso. It's not the less, it's the more. In other words, Newton and Kepler and Galileo and so on, as they unraveled the levels of understanding of nature, the greater grew their admiration for God because they could see what I fear many people cannot see today, that God and science do not compete as explanations because they're not even in the same category. Now, let me illustrate this because this is so important. I find kids at school can understand it, and some professors at university can't, but that's just how it goes. Suppose we got a Ford Galaxy motor car. You know what a Ford Galaxy is? And it's sitting here. And we look at its engine. I lift the hood. I think you call it the hood here. We call it the bonnet. Um, I lift the hood, and you see the engine. And I say, look, ladies and gentlemen, I want to offer you two explanations of this engine. Firstly, I want to offer you an explanation in terms of law and mechanism. The law of internal combustion and engineering design of an automobile engine. That's the one explanation. The other explanation is Henry Ford. Will you please choose between the two? Now, some of you laughed, so you got it. I find kids laugh. They roar, and they say, Sir, but that's silly. I say, exactly, it's silly. But why then do people like Richard Dawkins still insist on this kind of silly argument? Henry Ford is an explanation of the existence and origin of the vehicle. He doesn't compete with the explanation in terms of law and science at all. Because one is an explanation in terms of an agent, the other is an explanation in terms of law and mechanism. Now, that is very simple stuff, you know. But it's immensely important, and it can immediately take the sting of this whole problem. God doesn't compete with science as an explanation at all. The more that science reveals, the more I find myself worshipping the genius of the God who did it that way. But there's more to be said, ladies and gentlemen. Wittgenstein, whom I hope you read when you can't sleep, <laughs> Wittgenstein once said, the greatest deception of modernism is the idea that the laws of nature explain the phenomena of nature. You see, we've got the impression, because of the sheer power and success of science, which I admire as much as anybody else, I'm passionate about my science, but we are deceived into thinking that we've got explanations. For instance, the law of gravity, does that tell you what gravity is? No. I wish I'd been taught that at school. The law of gravity tells you how you can calculate accelerations and what happens with moving bodies as they go towards the center of the earth and uh, massive bodies as they are attracted to one another. It doesn't give you the remotest idea of what gravity is. Nobody knows what gravity is. Nobody knows what energy is. Nobody knows what time is. And yet we find, oh, science explains. It does at a certain level. So we need to become a little bit more humble. Because there's another thing lurking in the background of our discussion. And that's an epistemological notion. How we know things 
And many people are being persuaded by the Lawrence Krauses of this world and the Richard Dawkins that in the end, science is the only way to truth. Well, you better ha pack up your history and your languages and your literature's uh, faculties at Tulane then, if that's true. Science is not only not the only way to truth, it's not the way to the most interesting truths of all, and that are those concerned with meaning and significance of human beings. And yet we're told science is the only way to truth, which is a very odd statement, because that statement, science is the only way to truth, is not a statement of science, so if it's true, it's false. It's too late for logic like that at this time of night, isn't it? But there we are. But this seems to me to be immensely important. I'm passionate about science, ladies and gentlemen, but we do it no service, as Sir Peter Medawar said, Nobel Prize winner, by thinking that science can answer every question. He says it's so easy that, to see that science cannot answer the simple questions of a child. Where do I come from? Where am I going? What is the meaning of life? And students today, I discover, are looking for those connections, are looking for that bigger picture into which they fit. Science will not give it to them because it cannot give it to them. Again, I wish I'd been taught that at school, but I wasn't. And it's immensely important to see that a lot of this pressure to say that you cannot do science and believe in God is actual logical nonsense. There are still Nobel Prize winners, you know, who believe in God, and there are Nobel Prize winners that don't. And that should make it clear to us, ladies and gentlemen, that the problem is not that science and belief in God are in intrinsic conflict. What is in conflict are the two big worldviews that I mentioned earlier. The belief that this universe is all that exists, or theism, the belief that there is a God that created and maintains it. Those worldviews view, clash, and there are scientists on both sides. And one of the things you do at university is you ask yourself, what are the pointers? What direction does science point in? Now, Lawrence Krauss may be known to some of you because he's a particle physicist from ASU who's written a book called A Universe from Nothing. And he has uh, pronounced on various things, but he wrote an article in Newsweek not long ago saying that the Higgs boson is arguably more important than God. Now, you've all heard of the Higgs boson, I presume. This is the so-called God particle, although Professor Peter Higgs doesn't like that term, and nor do I, and nor does Lawrence Krauss, so at least we agree on that. But it's the particle that's been discovered in CERN in Geneva, and I was there recently at a conference talking with people including Krauss. But the very interesting thing was, he writes this article, the Higgs boson is arguably more important than God. It's relevant, God isn't. So I'm afraid I have enough of the Irish blood in me to want to respond to that. So I wrote an article for the London Times. You can see it online. And I raised the question, the Higgs boson is arguably more important than God for what? <laughs> well, certainly for particle physics. If you're explaining how particle physics works, talking about God won't help you, talking about the Higgs boson will. But... If you're talking about why there is a universe at all in which particle physics can be done, I would want to argue that God is arguably much more important than the Higgs boson. You see, again, there's this confusion, either or, God or science, when there is simply no need for it. Now, having said something about explanation, I feel I ought to say just a little bit more, because very frequently at this point, uh, Richard Dawkins will come in with his book, The God Delusion, and I was astonished to discover that its major argument is something that I used to hear a great deal in Russia, but very little in the UK. And the argument goes like this. Look, 
in the end, let's face it, if you believe in God, how can God be relevant to anything? Because God is by definition more complex than the thing you're explaining. If you say God created the universe, you're really postulating a God who's more complex than the universe to explain the universe. That's not an explanation, is it? Because it's more complex than the thing you're explaining. And in fact, the logic cannot stop there, can it? If you claim that God created the universe, then you'll have to ask who created God. And then you can't stop there. Logically, you'll have to ask who created the creator that created the creator that created the creator that created the creator. So on, ad absurdum, the whole thing's irrelevant. Forget God, let's go back to science. <laughs> well, I was astonished to meet that. Utterly astonished. I tried it on Richard Dawkins in one of our debates. I said, let's take the first bit of the argument. The explanation is more complex than the thing you're explaining. Okay. I pick up a book, 400 odd pages long. It's called The God Delusion. It's quite complex. <laughs> so I ask, what is its origin? And I discover its origin is in the, I presume, infinitely more complex mind of Richard Dawkins. <laughs> so, of course, I dismiss that explanation since it's more complex than the thing I'm explaining. It's absurdity, ladies and gentlemen. Where do we get the idea from that explanations go from the complex to the simple? That's something you need to investigate. It's wonderful when they do. Do they always? This is a very, very important thing because it can give us real insight in what's going on. When we study particle physics, we come down to things like quantum electrodynamics. They're not simple, ladies and gentlemen. I don't understand them. And Richard Feynman, one of the finest brains that's ever existed in the world in physics, Nobel Prize winner, an American scientist, said, don't let anybody kid you. Nobody understands quantum mechanics. <laughs> so there's no point in having quantum mechanics then, is there? It's so complex. Half a minute, who told us? that explanation has always got to be go from the complex to the simple. We're bamboozled into thinking that. And yet you know it isn't true on the very simplest of examples that I gave you of Richard Dawkins' book. Now, I'll come back to that in a moment. But let's take the other thing with it. While we're at it, we might as well. In for a penny, in for a pound. Who created the Creator? Sounds wonderful, this argument, doesn't it? But let's analyze it logically. Suppose I say to you, who created X? What does that mean? Well, it assumes that X is created, doesn't it? Who created X? You see, this is one of those questions. Philosophers have a word for it. They call it a complex question, which has hidden in it assumptions that close down on possibilities. Who created God? Hidden in that is the assumption that God is created, but what if he isn't? The question doesn't apply to something that's not created, does it? And you see that question that is the heart of the God Delusion book only applies to created gods. And as I made the point, none too gently, that if Richard Dawkins had written a book called The Created God's Delusion, I don't think many people would have bought it. Because we don't need him to tell us that created gods are a delusion. As Freud pointed out, we usually call them idols. Do you see the point? It's a very subtle thing. The real issue is, if you look at the God claim by the Bible, who's transcendent and uncreated, the question doesn't even apply to him. So it's a non-question when it comes to God, but it does apply to created God. So I said to Richard Dawkins, Richard, let me try your question on you. You believe the universe created you. Okay, let me ask you your question. Who created your creator? I'm still waiting for the answer. See, it works both ways. It is amazing to me, ladies and gentlemen. And I want to say this very strongly. 
that intelligent young people are being put off belief in God through the triviality of arguments like this. And I've no hesitation in saying that, and I say it in Oxford. I'm amazed, utterly amazed, at the intellectual poverty that rests behind arguments like this. There are much better arguments for atheism, but then it's not my job to, 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 <laughs> to, uh, to present them. Now, the next thing, and I'm going to stop in five minutes because I'm interested in your questions is this. Another big confusion that causes so much difficulty goes back to Peter Singer. When I said, but you remained in the faith that you were brought up in, but he said it isn't a faith, and then I said, but don't you believe it? This notion of faith, what do you think faith is, ladies and gentlemen? What do you think faith is? You see, I discover that most people really know what faith is after the banking crisis. We thought we could trust certain bankers. But then the basis for faith went, the markets froze, and confidence couldn't be regained, and there's still major difficulty in regaining it. Everybody in this room knows what evidence-based faith means. Faith comes from the Latin fides, which means trust reliability. But a very clever trick has been played by the new atheists. They've redefined faith. Faith, according to Richard Dawkins, is believing where there is no evidence, and it's a religious term solely. So when he meets me, he regards me as a man of faith. That's not a compliment. It's an insult. Lennox believes where there is no evidence. That's the definition of faith now. It's even crept into Webster's Dictionary. Faith, noun, believing where there's no evidence. That is blind faith, ladies and gentlemen. But all of us understand what faith normally means. You have faith in your friends. You have reasons for it. You trust your professors, I hope. You have reasons for it, and so on. We all, all the time, are exercising faith in every conceivable area of our lives, including science. But what has happened is this. Very cleverly, these people have isolated faith and said it's a religious concept. It means believing where there's no evidence, so you can forget about it. Because science, it doesn't have any faith. What utter nonsense. Einstein said he couldn't imagine a scientist without that faith. What did he mean? He meant this. Every scientist believes that the universe is accessible, at least in part, to the human mind. Science can be done. None of us would do science if we didn't believe that. We are men of faith and women of faith. We believe it can be done. Why do you believe it can be done? Now, here comes the interesting stuff. What's the rationale behind that faith that every scientist has got to have before you start science? You must believe it's worth doing. You must believe it can be done. Well, what is it that does the science? Well, it's my mind. What is my mind? Well, according to my atheist friends, my mind is my brain. And what is my brain? It's the end product of a mindless, unguided process. Pardon? If you knew that your computer that you use tomorrow morning was the end product of a mindless, unguided process, would you trust anything it produced? Of course you wouldn't. <laughs> Darwin saw that very clearly. It's known as Darwin's doubt. And he repeatedly referred to the idea that if, as I believe, he said, the mind of man has been descended from lowlier minds, how can it give us any semblance of truth? That argument, in a very much sharper form, has come center stage in contemporary philosophy. Fascinating book by Thomas Nagel, Mind and Cosmos, very provocative title. Let me read you the subtitle. Why the Neo-Darwinian account is almost certainly false an atheist philosopher 
What's he talking about? He's talking about this, ladies and gentlemen. If you subscribe to the dominant worldview in the academy, naturalism, that nature is all that exists, and therefore the mind is simply the end product of mindless, unguided processes, then you have a massive difficulty grounding your faith in rationality. Lewis saw it clearly. Plantinga, one of the world's most distinguished philosophers living here in North America, sees it very clearly. J.B.S. Haldane years ago said, you know, if the thoughts in my mind are simply the random motions of atoms in my brain, why should I believe that my brain's composed of atoms? Ladies and gentlemen, I want to submit to you tonight this. My biggest problem with the atheist worldview is that it cuts the ground from the rationality that I need to do my science. That's got nothing to do with God at all. How does Christianity fare on this? Wonderfully. Because it tells me that the reason we can do science is that the human mind in here and the universe out there are ultimately traceable back to an intelligent creator. That makes sense. Atheism, to my mind, makes no sense at all. Now my final point. It seems to me to be extremely important to realize that evidence-based faith is at stake both in the scientific endeavor and now I must speak for my own Christian faith. Other religions, quite rightly, have a right to speak for themselves. But as a young man, I had to ask myself this question. Is my faith in God evidence-based, or is it blind faith? Now, that is a very important question. The fourth gospel, the gospel of John, makes this statement. Many other signs Jesus did which are not written in this book, but these are written in order that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. In other words, John is saying, here is the evidence on which faith can be based. I'd stake my life on that. And that's why I've written recently a book in which I investigate the evidence for the major sign of those signs, and that is the resurrection of Jesus, looking at it through the eyes of skeptics. Because in the end, I wouldn't dream of standing here one minute in front of you, ladies and gentlemen, if I didn't believe that there was evidence for the truth of Christianity. One other little point. We talked about worldviews. I find this so interesting. You know, we've got common rooms in Oxford. I'm a fellow of a college, and when the discussion gets boring, sometimes I try little thought experiments, you see, <laughs> and to see what happens. And one of them is this. We're talking about explanations and I noticed as I flew in today, there appears to be a beach somewhere near here. So you go down to the beach at New Orleans tomorrow, and you see the ten letters of your name written in the sand. What do you deduce? You just walk up, and there they are. You immediately infer that whatever mechanism has been used to do that, there's an intelligence behind it. Isn't that so? Why do you infer that? Because of the semiotic nature of the marks on the sand. They carry meaning, which is significant for you. Isn't that right? Okay. Now let's do a bit of magic. And you're suddenly transported into a molecular biology laboratory. And you look into a stereoscopic magic microscope, and you see in it a double helix uncoding, unfurling. And you see letters spitting off it, C-G-A-A-T-T-G-G-C-A-A-T-G-C. -G -G and you say, what are those? 
Oh, those are codons. Those are letters of a genetic alphabet. Well, what is this? It goes on and on and on. Well, it's the human genome. How long is it? Three and a half billion letters. Is their order important? Absolutely. It's like a computer program. You can change one or two letters, but generally speaking, if you knock one out, you destroy the whole thing. The longest word we've ever discovered. And then I ask the question, tell me, what's the behind that? Oh, you say, obviously, chance and necessity. What? <laughs> what, you mean random processes and the laws of nature? Well, of course. What do you mean, of course? How is it that every one of us in this room can look at the ten letters of our name, and because it contains a coding, we instantly recognize intelligence? Whatever mechanisms have been used to put it on the beach. And we can look at the 3.5 billion letters of the human genome and say it's only chance and necessity. Ladies and gentlemen, let me reformulate the two worldviews as I stop. Carl Sagan, at the beginning of one of his TV series, says the cosmos is all that is, was, or ever shall be. In the beginning were the particles, was mass energy. And the particles have swirled together to form stars and galaxies, and they have, in their permutations under the laws of physics, they have produced worlds, a universe, or maybe a multiverse, life, intelligence, consciousness, and the idea of God, because there isn't a God. so that intelligence is derivative and mass energy is primary. The other view goes like this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things came to exist through Him. And without him, nothing came to be that came to be. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not only as a Christian, but as a scientist, that that explanation in terms of word and intelligence being primary, and mass energy and everything else being derivative, it's not only as a Christian, but as a scientist, that that makes infinitely more sense to me. Is God relevant? And now comes the bigger thing, which is not our topic for tonight. The central claim of Christianity is that the Word became human, ladies and gentlemen. That puts the relevance of God beyond all conceivable dispute. Thank you very much. You're very kind. Now, one thing about an audience like this is the following, that everybody is interested in the questions that other people have. <laughs> and so, we're going to do the Q&A this way. I'm going to collect four or five questions before I comment on any of them, so that we can see what kind of a spectrum of ideas is going on in the room. You'll find that much more interesting, and so will I. Now, the topic is clear. We're not here to answer questions about politics and all this kind of stuff. We're here to discuss this topic. So if you have a question, remember, your time formulating your question is time taken away from the next person. And I want to give as many people a chance, so just put up your hand. I recognize you. I'll write down your question, and we'll go to the next person. So who's going to start? Right, let's have a look at these for a minute. Well, that's very interesting. It gives us some idea of, of the uh, <coughs> spectrum of the whole uh, thing. Well, 
Let's uh, jump in here at the level of the second question, which uh, had to do with the, the fact that of Christianity, uh, Judaism, and Islam, uh, the attitude to science. And I referred to the uh, rise of modern science of the 16th and 17th century, which by common consent owes a great deal to the Judeo-Christian tradition. If you go back earlier, of course, um, our Islamic friends did a great deal in uh, preserving the knowledge that had gone before, particularly in the House of Wisdom in Baghdad, where many translators were involved in translating Greek texts that would have otherwise have been lost. Now, at the level of the lecture, I am not saying that Christian science trumps um, Muslim science or Jewish science. I'm not even saying it trumps atheist science. That's not what I'm saying at all. And I'm glad you raised the question, because atheists can do utterly brilliant science. The two men that decoded DNA, Crick and Watson, were both atheists, you see. So that's not what's at issue here. It's not whether a Christian faith will help you do better science. The question is this, which way does science point? That's a totally different question. And what I argue to you tonight is from both history and the nature of science, that what science points towards is a rationally intelligible universe because there is a rational creator. That belief in a rational creator is, of course, shared by the three major monotheistic religions. So at that level, there is no real difference at all, and I wouldn't want that to be misunderstood. Now, related to that is the final question where <coughs> you ask about the statistics of belief in God, that it is notable that you tend to have fewer biologists believing in God and more physicists and chemists and, uh, and uh, cosmologists and so on. All kinds of reasons have been put forward uh, on that topic. Some people say, well, biology has never gone through the kind of revolution uh, that quantum mechanics brought to physics, the macro and the micro and all this kind of thing. I'm not so sure about that. I think one of the reasons has inevitably to be this, that when it comes to arguing from science towards God, there are non-controversial arguments and there are very controversial arguments. Let me explain what I mean by that. And that relates to another of the questions, which is why I'm glad I asked them all together, you see. <coughs> The question seven was, is earth finely tuned for life? Now, I was debating in the Oxford Union just a few weeks ago with uh, Michael Shermer, the editor of Skeptics magazine, and, uh, and another couple of people, amongst whom was Professor Peter Millikan, who's a, an atheist philosopher at Oxford. And uh, he invited me to dinner the following week to grill me with about 50 of his students. He thought 50 to 1 was about the right proportion. <laughs> and uh, so we had a very interesting discussion. And I said to him, Peter, what would you say from an atheist perspective was the strongest argument in my favor? Oh, he said, without the slightest doubt, the fine-tuning argument. He said, if I wanted to put a case for your side, I would immediately go to fine-tuning because fine-tuning is recognized by most people. It's what people are desperately trying to explain. For instance, all you have to do is to get a copy of uh, Hawking and Mladenov's book, The Grand Design, and he goes on page after page about the incredibly sensitive fine-tuning. And then he says, well, some people would believe in a creator, but that's not the answer of science. I've written a little book on that as well, incidentally, because that's false logic. But the point that that I want to make just in there is this. The fine-tuning argument seems to me to be immensely powerful. It is to be expected, actually, from the Bible, incidentally. Some people think the Bible is irrelevant to all of this. It isn't. The Bible isn't a scientific textbook, but one of the very interesting things it says at its very beginning, relating to your question, 
is that God didn't create everything at once. Now, setting aside all these questions about what the days mean, the bare fact that most of us miss is the striking thing that the Bible claims there was a beginning, but God didn't create everything at once. There is a sequence leading to a goal. In other words, the universe is fine-tuned, to put it in the terms of the physicists. It has a teleology. It has a goal. It has a plan. It has intentionality. So, because that argument is there, and because the fine-tuning is accepted as normative physics, that seems to me to at least partially explain why you get more physicists and cosmologists believing in God. Because when it comes to the biological sphere, some at least of the arguments about God are based not on accepting the consensus, but on going against it. Now, I'm not going to go into that debate uh, at the moment. I will just, in a couple of seconds, go into it very briefly. But that would seem to me to make a certain differentiation. And secondly, there's been a lot of publicity since Thomas Huxley's day and Darwin's day of openly saying that evolutionary theory is an engine to drive atheism. That is said in many textbooks. Now, of course, there are many people who reject that utterly. I reject it utterly. You cannot deduce atheism from evolution. But many people say that you can, and that is stuck in the modern psyche, so that biology has become aligned with atheism in a way in which physics, chemistry, and cosmology have not. Now, there's a great deal more that can be said about that. But that, remember, ladies and gentlemen, this is a Q&A. I can only give uh, suggestions on how we begin to look at these questions, because all of these questions deserve uh, a lecture on their own. Now, um, let's have a look here. <coughs> Are the skeptics influenced by a rejection of a priori knowledge rather than empirical? I <coughs> suspect that there's something in what you say. I think one of the things that the sociology of science has taught us in recent years is the old idea of science being completely objective is gone. Most scientists like me, perhaps that's overstated, would be critical realists. We believe that there's truth out there. We can access it, at least in part, but we never absolutely grasp it. But we bring a set of presuppositions a priori to it. Now, some people are more honest in admitting that. I think the most stunning example is Richard Lewinton of Harvard, the geneticist, who says, look, he says, you know, science itself, does not compel us to look for materialist explanations. It doesn't. It's our a priori, and I'm quoting now, commitment to materialism that forces us to accept naturalistic explanations, no matter how counterintuitive they are, etc., etc., etc. And then he says this, for we cannot allow a divine foot in at the door. Now, that's breathtakingly honest, but it's showing how an a priori commitment to materialism is affecting his science. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me say something here to get a sense of proportion. 99.9% .9 of science doesn't raise these questions. It's only in a couple of areas to do with origins mainly that these questions come up. And it's very easy to lose our sense of proportion. 99% of science just doesn't raise these questions. But these areas do. Now, talking about a priori commitment, why is evolution such a big deal? Now, I'm not going to, don't uh, fool yourselves, I'm not going to go into this. I'm only going to make one very simple observation. The problem is that evolution is the only area of science I know where you can deduce most of it from philosophy without reference to data. <laughs> now, what do I mean by that? You cannot deduce Newton's laws or Einstein's equations from any philosophical viewpoint. But if you assume that materialism or naturalism is true, that is, that mass energy is all that exists, and then you're asked, please, on that assumption, account for the existence of life. You have got to produce an evolutionary theory, as Lucretius did centuries ago. 
and he got everything Darwin got except the transmutation of species. Now, that's not a comment on whether evolution is right or wrong, or how much is right or how much is wrong. It's a comment on why the problem is difficult. It's because there's such a close tie between that theory and materialistic philosophy. And you see, if it is true that life cannot be explained, as Thomas Nagel is now suggesting, an atheist, and consciousness even more, and rationality even more, cannot be explained in terms of physics and chemistry. That doesn't just mean a little adjustment. That means that naturalism is false as a philosophy. I recommend, if you're interested in this, to read Nagel, because he's not biased. But this is immensely important stuff, and it is the reason why the whole thing is a, a, a very complex business. Now, what's the next thing? We've got a few more minutes, I understand. So let's, let's, let's have a look at this. Um, we'll finish the science things, and we'll come to other things. There is a question here about... I'm arguing that God and science are not in conflict, but half a minute. Surely science has discovered the laws of nature, and they show that miracles are impossible, so that belief that Jesus turned water into wine or rose from the dead is impossible. I'm glad you asked the question. It was in my notes to talk about it, but I ran out of time, so thank you. I was on the Charlie Rose show recently. Have you heard of Charlie Rose? It hasn't been aired yet, but I was invited over for some reason to meet none other than Richard Dawkins again for an hour. <laughs> and on the Charlie Rose show, he started by mocking my faith in God. He said, you know, this is just a caricature. I can't imitate Richard Dawkins. Um, but it went something like this, ladies and gentlemen, this is John Lennox, and believe it or not, you know, he's a professor at Oxford, and he actually believes. I mean, you can scarcely credit it. He believes that Jesus turned water into wine. And I said, stop right there. I said, you know, Richard, if Jesus is the Word of God incarnate, he'd already created water. And perhaps turning it into wine wasn't such a big deal after all. <laughs> but then I said, more seriously, we could talk all night on this program about the miracles of Jesus. You wouldn't listen. And I said, you wouldn't listen because you think that David Hume, the, Enlightenment, the Scottish Enlightenment philosopher, solved this problem long ago when he described miracles as violations of the laws of nature, and therefore we couldn't believe in them. So what we need to talk about, Richard, now is this. Was Hume right or was he wrong? He was wrong. And it's very easy to see that he was wrong. Lewis saw it brilliantly. So let me use his illustration, because as usual, most people can understand it. I stay in a hotel here, and I put $100 into the drawer last night, and I put $100 tonight. $200, yes? One plus one's two? Wake up tomorrow, and there are $50 in the drawer. So what do I conclude? That the laws of arithmetic have been broken, or the laws of Louisiana have been broken? <laughs> Now, your laughter shows you've got the point, and it's a very important philosophical point. You see that the laws of Louisiana are not the same kind of law as the law of arithmetic. There's a lot of confusion about that, you know, out there. Secondly, what is it that tells you that the laws of, the, the laws of Louisiana have been broken? It's your knowledge of the laws of arithmetic. If you didn't know the laws of arithmetic, you'd never recognize. You'd have said, well, 100 plus 100 is 200. Yesterday is 50 today, so what? <laughs> you see, ladies and gentlemen, if we pursue this, it's very helpful. It's very simple, actually. Most of these things are very simple. What is a miracle? Does it break the laws of nature? Of course not. 
God feeds a new event into the system from the outside. The laws of arithmetic tell me 100 plus 100 is 200. They can't stop a thief putting his hand in and taking 150 out, can they? But you've got to know them in order to recognize that the thief has put his hand in. So, God has created a universe with regularities that he is responsible for, that we recognize. And here's the answer to another question of David Hume that... In the uh, biblical days, they were primitive and they didn't know the laws of nature, so they recognized miracles all over the place. That's utter nonsense. The people in the first century knew that dead bodies remained dead just as much as we do. <laughs> Joseph knew where babies came from. <laughs> and when his wife said she was pregnant, he wanted to divorce her. Not because he was ignorant and primitive of the laws of nature, but because he knew them. The fact that there's a universe with built-in regularities is one side of it, that we recognize and know we've got to. The God that created it isn't a prisoner of those normative things. Of course he isn't. It's an absurdity. Now, the resurrection of Jesus would be breaking the laws of nature if I argued that it was explicable in terms of natural processes going on in the tomb five minutes before it occurred, but I'm not. No Christian claims that. When the New Testament describes the resurrection of Jesus, it describes it using every Greek word there is for power. It's something from the outside. And nature, as we Ah, but here's the question. Naturalism believes that this universe is a closed system of cause and effect. But it isn't, of course. It isn't. So that helps me to understand that Hume is just wrong, simply wrong. And so it's a question of history to determine whether or not something supernatural happened in the grave of Jesus. Of course, I'm not going to fall into the trap of believing in every claim to the supernatural. We've got to test them on the basis of evidence. What is the evidence? And that's why uh, in my book, Gunning for God, that's just come off the press, the last chapter is devoted to looking at the resurrection through the eyes of David Hume for exactly that reason. So your question is very much justified. On the one hand, I'm arguing tonight that science as an endeavor, the very fact that we can do it, is based on the assumption of a rationally intelligible universe. And historically and philosophically, that points towards an intelligent God. Now, if we come down to the subdivisions of the questions, what about supernatural and so on? Those fit in perfectly, but they depend, as you've just seen, on different and very important considerations. Near-death experiences, are they evidence? I'm not an expert on near-death experiences. But the way I approach this whole thing, and I, I just speak from ignorance here, is that for me, central is the resurrection of Jesus, which isn't a near-death experience, it's a complete death experience, followed by a resurrection. And whatever you argue or don't argue about near-death experiences, and some of my friends who are experts in these things find them very interesting. Higher and bigger, of course, and central to this whole thing is the claim that death is not the end because Jesus has broken the death barrier. And it's on that that my Christian faith rests, centrally on that. Not a near-death experience, a death experience. And the fact that he actually died and was buried is a very important part of the evidence. Now, there was someone asked about creation and evolution. I'm going to give you a shameless answer to this. I've written a book on it. <laughs> it's called God's Undertaker, A Science Buried God. We don't have the time tonight to be fair to your question. I'd love to have another hour, but I wasn't asked to. So, sorry about that. But let me just say, I have a website, johnlennox.org, where there are lots of things on this kind of topic. And this is such an important question. It's a very nuanced thing. 
you see, because it really is two questions and they get confused. The two questions are this. Whatever you think about evolution, can you deduce atheism from it? That's question number one. That's a logical and philosophical question. I don't think you can. Then there comes the very, the very dangerous and risky question, and that is how much weight can the evolutionary hypotheses bear? And, uh, well, you could read my little book, but read Thomas Nagel and see what an atheist is now beginning to say. Because it's very interesting that there has been admission in some circles, not many, that people have been so frightened of the supernatural that they have sort of papered over cracks where the science hasn't really been done. And, you know, people talk about a god of the gaps. I don't understand it. God did it. There is such a thing as the evolution of the gaps. We don't know what happened, but evolution did it, you see. But that's something that you need to investigate. But you'll find around the world that many uh, uh, Christians accept either in large part or partially the, the, the Darwinian hypothesis because they don't see it as threatening faith in God. Others feel it's more controversial. So, in order to discuss it in detail, but um, I just can't do that tonight. I want to come to the final question, which was the very first question. And uh, there's a lot behind this question. I'll answer it as quickly as I can, because I promised to be done by nine o'clock. Um, and that is, I've been talking about religion not being essentially in conflict with science. And that is now being qualified, quite rightly so, by the questioner. And again, it's something I left out in the hope it would be asked by somebody who is interested in it. And they say, but half a minute, didn't Galileo suffer persecution from the Christian church? And isn't there such a track record, really, looking back, even in my own country, of religion, indeed Christianity, promo promoting wars and famines and violence and everything else? And uh, what do you say about all that? Well, I say an awful lot about that, because it's a very important question. And we need to factor it into the equation. So, let me say one or two things very briefly about that question. Firstly, Galileo. He's a fascinating character, really. You see, Galileo, we have this wonderful story. You'd almost think Galileo was an atheist and the Catholic Church persecuted him and hounded him virtually to death. That isn't true. Galileo was a believer in the Bible and in God when he started and when he finished. His first critics weren't the Catholic Church. His first critics were the philosophers, the Aristotelian philosophers, because they all believed and had for centuries that the earth was fixed and didn't move. So, it was the worldview of the time, they, if you like, the scientists of the time, although that word wasn't in existence then, that was the worldview that the earth didn't move. Now, the Catholic Church had bought into that and felt that the Bible supported it. God has set the earth on its pillars so that it shouldn't be moved. But it is wrong to think of this as a conflict between science and religion, and indeed, I've worked with um, uh, John Hedley Brook at Oxford, one of the world's leading professors of science and religion, and they all say, the one thing you cannot do with the Galileo story is use it to perpetuate the so-called conflict myth. And the Catholic Church didn't tyrannize Galileo. He was put under house arrest, and he was looked after very comfortably for the rest of his life. So, we need, to, we need to get that into proportion. But it's very important to see you cannot use that as an iconic example of science versus religion. The more serious point is the, uh, the point about, look, uh, you have presented this glowing picture that the Judeo-Christian tradition was responsible for science, but half a minute, I can paint you another picture, and I can paint it from your own country. In fact, if you knew, you could paint it from my own family, because my brother was nearly killed by an IRA bomb. So, what do I say about that? Here we have a country, two sides, a religious divide, Protestant and Catholic, fighting each other. Well, now, that's a complex problem. It's not all to do with religion at all. But suppose it were. That's the impression the world has got. 
What do we say about it? Well, let me say what I say about it, because I'll have to cut this short. I'm utterly ashamed of it, ladies and gentlemen. That's what I am. Utterly. I'm utterly ashamed that the name of Christ has ever been associated with an AK-47 or a bow and arrow. But I want to tell you why. I'm ashamed of it because Christ himself forbade the use of weapons in the defense of his message. Now, this is very important. Here's one of the greatest ironies in the world. I've debated Christopher Hitchens a couple of times, the late Christopher Hitchens. And in one of the debates at the Edinburgh Festival, he spent the first 15 minutes talking about these awful religious wars and what Christianity had done. And when I got up, I just said, Christopher, I agree with you. That's the unacceptable face of it. And then I said what I'm about to say to you. Ladies and gentlemen, if we want to assess Christianity vis-a-vis -vis this, we need to look at the trial of Christ. He was put on trial by the Romans. Do you know what he was accused of? He was accused of political violence. He was accused of the very thing that the new atheists accused Christianity of. Now, this is a critical moment in history. Jesus is accused of stirring up political violence. Is he guilty or not? He claimed to be a king. And so Pilate because he regarded the case as so serious, the leading Roman commander took the case himself. That is very dramatic. Are you a king, he said to Jesus. My kingdom is not of this world. Otherwise, my servants would have been fighting that I should not be delivered to the Jews, was the reply. And instantly Pilate knew that Jesus wasn't guilty of political violence. He had the report on his desk of the centurion who led the squad that went to arrest Jesus when one of the disciples, who wasn't a good swordsman, tried to cut off somebody's head and just cut off their ear. <laughs> you remember that? I'm glad you laughed at it because you remember what I'm now going to say. If you take weapons to defend Christ or his gospel, that's what you'll do in a big way, cut the ears off people. Why do many of my atheist friends, they won't even listen to the Christian message because their ears have been cut off by the violence that has been perpetrated in the name of Jesus when he forbade it. Let me say this very clearly. People who resort to violence in the name of Christ aren't following him. They're disobeying him. This isn't Christian, ladies and gentlemen. Ah, but there's another very important thing. Why? Does Christ repudiate violence? Because of the nature of his message, of course. And this is one of the reasons I'm a Christian. If this message is true, Christ is God incarnate. He invented the atom. He invented light. He invented the biochemical pathways. He thought out the human brain. And he became human because he loved me and wanted me to have the possibility of a relationship with God, not simply to know the universe through science, but to have a relationship with God. Oh, now, these are the big things. These are the big things. Is God relevant? I find that such a funny question from where I sit. Some of you would give your right arm to know a pop star or a leading basketball player or a NASCAR driver or whatever. What about getting to know the God that invented the universe and living a life of fellowship and friendship with him that's meaningful and instead of ending with 70 years plus or minus a little bit in a grave, opens up into the potential of a vast eternity because Jesus rose from the dead. That's big stuff. I don't find that in the limiting, tiny, pusillanimous philosophies of atheism. No, I don't. 
Jesus repudiated violence because his message was a message of love and truth. And the one thing you cannot do, ladies and gentlemen, is impose truth by force. Big questions, aren't they? You have to answer and I have to answer. Is God relevant? Good night, ladies and gentlemen. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.